again, we got some questions from some, from some of our followers. Do you want to shout out the first one here? You guys made so many connections to all of them, but I think the first one that's, that's worth jumping into in order is we had a great question. Last time we talked a lot of a decent amount about understanding when to go and when to go, when to go hard and when to go easy. Both Dave and DJ mentioned this already as Nathan did in terms of knowing kind of when to back off, when to go hard. So we had a question going, can you expand a little bit on uh, Dave, your uh, philosophy on the balance between quality trading and having enough rest? And this is a common challenge, not just in coaching, but other areas in addition to strength, like straight coaching and in rehab as well as knowing, yeah, what's that balance like? So how do you see that and how do you provide that in your coaching? Sure. Well, I mean, first of all, I get this, I get this question a lot. I mean, uh, obviously as a coach, and I know you guys have done some coaching as well and stuff, and, and you've, you've had good quality coaches in, in your lives. Um, as a coach, we can't take everybody on number one. So we have to interview the athlete, you know, and I've been doing this for 20 years now. And I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but within about three to four minutes, Nathan, you passed the test, um, you know, uh, but I can figure out whether they're going to be, you know, an expectation runner or a holistic runner. And I can figure that out really, really quickly. Um, but at the end of the day, when, when they ask, you know, Dave, what is your philosophy or how do you coach? You know, I was lucky enough when I started in this, in this game to just make sure that I wanted to be successful from every angle of the sport. I wanted to be extremely well versed. I wanted to be well versed in all aspects of the sport. So I studied the likes of Lydiard. I studied the likes of probably the guy I'd say who I really relate with the most, both mentally and physically, is the great Joe Vigil. Um, Billy Squires, who obviously coached Greg Meyer, Boston Billy Rogers, uh, Salazar for a point. Uh, we'll talk about books later. There's a new one that just came out that's amazing on, on Billy Squires. Zadopak, uh, you know, Percy Cerruti. All that stuff is great. You know, I, I, was, I was blessed to have good legendary high school and collegiate coaching on but at the end of the day, when people say, what's your philosophy? It's the Dave Ames philosophy. It's not everybody else's philosophy. And I do feel that the most successful coaches and runners out there are the ones who can blend all of those things into their own, because then you're adaptable to all different types of athletes. I really think that some of your best coaches on the planet are not just elite coaches, or they're not just track club, slow coaches. They're versatile coaches that can handle the 430 marathoner, but they can handle the guy trying to break 210 or the gal trying to break 230 or 220. And so adapting those philosophies into my own philosophy has helped me basically utilize all those skills and, and correlate the task at hand, which is obviously the individual, the individual runner. Um, you know, balancing rest and, and hard training can be very, very difficult we have a problem with rest in our industry right now. I think we've talked, we talked, we talked, touched on this last time. Rest actually equals growth, right? So in order to rest, it baffles me sometimes when we talk, we're going to talk about this later. We're talking about tapering, right? Well, tapering means reducing volume, right? So that is technically resting. So if we understand that a taper works, right? Why can't we understand that that off day in our training plan 20 weeks ago really had a purpose? You know, so at the end of the day, it baffles me. So some runners don't realize that if the coach writes the off day, there's a scientific purpose of why that is in there. And we just have a problem because there's too much information out there in our sport that's telling us that rest is bad. Rest is not good. Go look at a uh, go look at somebody's training training log. Right. And, and, and you know, you're supposed to have Sunday and Friday off, say, say, say you write training for them five days. Sunday's full of uh, a hit class and a, and a hard Peloton ride. Friday's uh, uh, CrossFit. And then you look at the seven days, including the 60 miles you also ran in that week. And you say, well, where's the rest? And then you wonder why the runner's not getting anywhere because science, in order for science to take place, rest is part of the equation. So how do you balance that with good running? Well, you don't do it like they did many, many years ago. We talked about this last time too, the Tuesday interval session, the Thursday tempo, and then hammer the hell out of your long run on Saturday, it will come back to bite you all, all the time. And what runners don't understand is that adaptation happens through rest. So say Tuesday, you run five by a mile. All right. So it's going to take us, what, three to four days, maybe for that to physiologically saturate, right? Or something, depending on the athlete, right? Well, why would you come back on Thursday and go try to hammer tempo when you already stressed a different form of the aerobic system with VO2 max the first day, you need to let that, isn't the point of 
teaching and coaching and, and even as a runner, getting the maximum benefit out of your workout, right? So if we're wanting the maximum benefit of our workout, we have to let our workout scientifically do its purpose. So if you want to run another, uh, another workout that week, save it for Saturday or Sunday when you have three or four days of, of easy running under your belt. Remember, rest doesn't mean you have to take the day off. It also means it can be an easy run. And, and that, you know, instead of coming back and, and running another workout. That is if they actually take that run easy, and which <laughs> we get well, into some trouble with that, some of these watches. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, exactly. So, so you, you really just have to balance, but the to, to, to sum all of this up, my philosophy as many runners should hopefully take this philosophy themselves is find the correct balance. Where do you run the best at what mileage that you're not injured, that you're happy, that it doesn't feel like it's sure that your race results are, are the best and that you're gaining every week. You're not plateauing, you're not declining. And if you can find that balance between rest and hard training, you're good. You know, I look at, I could probably, some of my athletes push them a little harder to get 30 or 45 seconds extra off of a half marathon PR. But if that 30 or 45 seconds means they're always going to be in PT or they're always going to be injured. Well, as we were talking earlier, probably not good for me as a coach, if it gets around that I break everybody in half. Right. So of course, and I ran some statistics last time and I cleaned them up actually for this one. We have 88% of our athletes since the beginning of Aim for It Run Coaching in 2017 with a healthy running record here. And there's been a lot of people who have been here the whole time. There's been a lot of people who've been in and out and come back or I'll never see again. But I do feel that that, that balance between hard work and rest is what has given us those statistics versus me really trying to maybe get more, again, expectation coaching or get a little more egotistical and, you know, next thing you know, we do something that's a little over somebody's head. And next thing you know, that goal race that that person wanted to go to, well, they don't end up going because they're hurt. Right. So, you know, it's, and this goes with, you know, somebody, there was a question, I, I don't know if we're going to touch on it, but there was a question about what's the maximum mileage, what was it, like, to run a three-hour marathon, right? Or like, what's the best, what do you, how did he phrase it, Matt? He said, what's the average mileage to run under three, uh, to run under a three-hour marathon? The individual is currently 55 and debating going up versus adding uh, faster running in. Gotcha. So what that, if, if that uh, individual is listening, understand that it's, there is no secret. Too many people in, in this sport think there's a secret weapon workout, that there's a secret sauce, that there's a secret coach, all that stuff. What the individual who asked that question, and that's a great question, by the way, they need to figure out themselves. They need to figure out not anybody else's just because we have boatloads of females here that can break a three hour marathon that are 45 years old plus, but they're not running 80 a week anymore. They're running 55 a week now because they're 45, 47. So do they need to run 80 and run 302 or do they want to run 254 and run healthier? So, you know, it's, it's a toss up and it's a tough one because, you know, we've talked about this before, Matt, that it's the runner doesn't want to listen. And that goes with the cross training, like you said, and you see this in PT all the time too. Well, yeah. What would you say are, uh, I have so many things I want to ask or say too, but what, what would you say, you know, what are those, some of those signs to learn yourself? You know, like what are some of those things that would say, oh, I should probably add mileage or I should probably not add mileage and more think about making more quality workouts instead of increasing mileage. What, what do you look at in your runners for that? Well, communication, I, mean, I need to know from them what's going on. I mean, I can write things on paper all day long, but if they're not going to fill out the online training portal that, that I use and give me data or give me data, give me feedback, I'm coaching blind. You yeah. know, I want to know, but I think also if you don't have a coach or you don't have a, at the end of the week, you should have your own training log and it should be a private training log on top of maybe the one you share with your coach. But at the end of the day, that training log at the end of the week, you should be able to assess that week. What did I get out of this week? And then, you know, let's face it, races dictate where we are at or time trials or workouts and things. You know, if we're falling off the last couple mile repeats of a six by mile sesh, you know, the last three times we did it over 16 weeks or something, well, all right, we need some late race stamina. Either, either our engine's not strong enough or maybe our leg speed's just not fast enough to keep up with our heart, you know? So there, there's a lot of things that we can do. But again, communication helps that too. Now, if you don't have anybody to communicate with, I guess the proof does lie in the pudding. Go back and look at your results, look at your workouts, look at your races. Um, you know, but a lot of this all just comes down to understanding feel 
And that comes mm -hmm. from, you know, either your coach or, or good reference or, you know, podcasts like this, you know, knowing that the data isn't always what you need. It's really up here versus how, how, you, how you're working with your muscles. Yeah. yeah. Two, two quick things that I wanted to touch on that you had, that you had talked about. One was talking about all your different influences of philosophy, how they've all like, oh, there's a lot of really good books that you've read. There's a lot of good, you know, mentors that you've learned from. And the way you answered the question was a lot like what Matt said before about how research talks about the general and it, ha and it only has a certain amount of generalizability to people. And I think what you do well and like what we have to do as clinicians every single day is take the whole body of literature and what we know about the science and then give it to that person because the person is different. 99% of the time, they're not gonna be perfect in the inclusion criteria of that study. Um, and then even if they are, they might not respond exactly like the best person in that study or even the average. So I think that there's a lot of wisdom in there and in, in kind of what you were saying about how you have to take all of the philosophies and tune it to an individual. And that's a skill that takes time to develop. That's what clinical expertise is in the, in the physical therapy world. Like there, there's a reason uh, expert opinion is in our clinical practice guidelines. Uh, we have these huge things that go through some of the more common uh, types of pain or injuries or conditions that we see. And expert opinion is one of the levels of evidence because not everybody fits into a research study. Yep. And then um, there's something else, but it, it, it's gone. So <laughs> Matt, why don't also, you jump? Oh, you go DJ. Yeah, no, I just also wanted to add too, like subjective value is huge too, how you are feeling, how you are checking in with yourself. And like, I've been running competitively since 2008, maybe. I'm still figuring that out, you know? And it's like, it's, it's sometimes it's seasonal dependent and it's kind of like maybe one year your legs are really hot and you can close like a madman, but you can't hang for the middle part of the race or whatever. And like, you have different strengths at different points. And so figuring that out with yourself and whether it's from a competition and performance standpoint, or even just a recovery standpoint, like how can you absorb your training? Because that's what it comes down to is you can only get better if you're able to absorb and then continue growing. So yeah. exactly. There's so I remember my other thing. Yeah, go for it. Okay. The other thing I was gonna say is some of the the now healthiest and some of the best runners that I work with now um, are the ones who've had a major injury or surgery. Because what surgery does to people is it actually makes you understand what rest does. Because, you know, if, I, if I'm working with somebody post-op ACL, you know, reconstruction, and they go out and they do 10 squats and then their knee blows up, they, they learn to understand what, like, there's just a, a deeper understanding of what work does to your body and that it does need time to recover. And so, you know, even smaller surgeries like meniscectomy uh, or just some kind of debridement, people learn what it means to rest in those acute periods of their rehab. And I find that they just understand. And I don't want everyone to need to have surgery, including myself, to learn that lesson, that rest is super valuable, that you can get so much out of it, and that it can actually be detrimental to your body if you don't take the rest you need. So um, I just find that anecdotally, those people going through surgeries have are more tuned with their bodies than the ones that haven't um, sometimes. Yeah. I, I'd say some of the most dialed in runners I have right now, and I, I'd consider like right now being maybe the last couple of years, like through the pandemic and stuff, people have been very loyal and, and, some, and some people have coached five, seven, eight years plus. Um, they all went through a major setback somewhere along the lines. And before that setback, they were doing all the wrong things. And that setback taught them, and again, like you said, Nathan, I mean, we don't ever want to uh, have a surgery take place, but right. whether that, what, if something happens out of their control, that's, that's the beauty of this sport. And it's, I don't know if it's a good thing or bad thing, but this sport will remind you really quickly. I mean, look at like, like we just talked about, about this morning up in New Hampshire. I mean, both of these gals, extremely talented runners. And, and by the way, very proud of them. They gave it all that that's all that matters but they just had an average day. And you know what? That happens. And they will learn from that and, 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 and move and, and move on, uh, you know, I, I, through and stay the course. So yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a complex situation. Right. 